If you're visiting with us, we've been going through a series entitled From a Pastor's Heart, and there's two reasons that it's entitled that. One is because it's from a pastor, the Apostle Paul, who's writing to the church in Rome and, and sharing things from his heart, and particularly what we're talking about today is salvation. The second reason we're going through it is because it's from this pastor's heart and sharing it with each and every one of you that we might really know, get and understand uh, God's love and his grace for us. All right, um, as many of you well know, how many of you are sports fans? Anybody, we got sports fans out there? How many for baseball? All right, football, basketball, hockey. I mean, yeah, yeah, d- d- soccer. How about that one? Okay, not as much. You know, we, we, we in America, we have this view that everybody thinks about us and our World Series and, and our Super Bowl and the greatest games on earth. You know, there's more, by far, soccer fans than there are uh, any of the American sports that we think of. But I want to take you back because some of you have your favorite teams. It might be a high school team, might be a college team, might be a a professional team. Uh, But we all get our favorite teams and then we have of those teams seem to be the favorite rivals. Now I want to take you back a few years going back to one of the oldest rivals uh, in baseball is, who's it belong to? Who's it know? What? The Yankees and the Red Sox. Ah, how many Red Sox fans do we have? How many Yankees fans? All right. And yet we can come and worship Jesus together. And he is our peace. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. So, but I want to take you back some years ago, or probably about 100 years ago now, or getting close to it anyway, uh, that the arguably greatest player who ever lived was Babe Ruth. And Babe had played for Boston, but then lo and behold, one day he gets sold to, of all teams, the Yankees. But Boston fans well know this verse or this phrase that says, the curse of the Bambino. Because it took, they were world champions before, but it took another 86 years. They had a drought. It was called the curse of Bambino because as soon as they, they sold him to those dreaded Yankees, the Yankees started winning and the Red Sox started losing that curse of the Bambino. But anyway, you get the point. You, you know what it's like uh, to see maybe your favorite player. I grew up in Tampa. I remember the Buccaneers when everybody was wearing paper bags over their head, you know. I was a fan then. And every once in a while, we'd get a decent player. But then it would seem like they would ship them off to somebody else. As soon as we got a good player, it's like, well, he won't be around long. It was like we were the farm team for everybody else. Same way. I've been a Rays fan ever since they've opened up. And as soon as we get somebody good, it seems like within a few years, they're being shipped off somewhere else. And we know that pain. And sometimes when they go to that rival team, it is like, Etu Brute, really? Of all the teams, that's the one that you go to? It seems like you should have had a clause that said, I'll go to any team but that one. But you didn't. You sold out. Now, I want you to take all that, that frustration and anger at that, that one who sold out. And I want you to imagine it now. We're going to actually make a parallel within the church. Because there was an all-star Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and and he was one of the best ever, and he was a leader on their team. And then suddenly something happened, and he got shipped off to the rival team, those dreaded, hated, upstart Christians. They couldn't believe it. It's like, et tu, Paul? Really? You? You're going to do this? Because you're the Jew. You're, you're the Pharisee of Pharisees. You know all the laws. And in fact, Paul went from persecuting the church to leading the church. The question we have to ask is why? Why would he do that? Why would he change to the opposing team? Well, it's because something happened in his life. Jesus Christ. He had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Many of you were living life one way for the opposing team. And you had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's why you are here today. 
But not only did he go to the opposing team, he started preaching against some of the things that they had known and preached and taught for thousands of years. And the question we're dealing with today is, is how do we get right with God? How can we have righteousness with God? In the Old Testament, through the Mosaic law that God gave to Moses, and and they've been teaching for thousands of years in Judaism that there's one way to be saved, there's one way to be right with God, and that's to follow all the laws. And in fact, the Pharisees were so excited about the laws, they added hundreds more, which nobody could keep up with. You know what the Pharisees' job was? Do right stuff. That's what their job was. The rest of the Jews said, oh man, look, there goes one of those Pharisees. You know what they do? They do right stuff. They know better than anybody how to be right with God because they follow all the laws of God. And then you have the Jew of Jews, the Pharisee of Pharisees, Saul, who becomes Paul, is suddenly preaching for the other team. He went from persecuting the church to leading the church. And not only that, he's telling people that the law is old. It's passe, it's gone, and he's teaching people that salvation can only come one way. It is a gift of God through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For this church at this time, because I want you to imagine what it was like to be in the church. So the, the first members of the church were Jews. And they had learned the old way and they knew it for thousands of years. How many of you were taught something when you were a kid and you still do it today even though you know it's really not right, but it was something that was ingrained in you. I was reading something from Andy Stanley this week and many of you know his father, Charles Stanley. And he says, my dad, Charles, was raised in a family that think that thought drinking coffee was evil. And people are like, what? (laughs) Charles Stanley can't drink coffee because it's evil. And some of you are evil until you drink the coffee. (laughs) Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you, Gail, and our and our hospitality teams that make sure all those people, those monsters and demons that show up for church are transformed by that coffee. But, but he said it's funny because even though Charles still doesn't think of it as being evil, he still won't drink it today. It was just something that was ingrained to him. Some of you were raised in the Roman Catholic Church and you had to fight tooth and nail to get into any other church because you were taught long ago. There are many people not here today but not in the Roman Catholic Church because they were taught by their families, if you go to another church, you'll die. You just won't go to heaven. Everybody goes to hell if you're not going to the Roman Catholic Church. And there's still people that they don't really think that, they really don't believe it, but they're not going to go against mama. You know, so we have these rules that are ingrained in us. And I want you to think about that because the, the way that they understood righteousness was that it came through obedience. And for thousands of years, that's what they were taught. You have to obey the rules. Follow the rules if you want to be right with God. And so now that they're Christians, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They believe that he is the Christ. In fact, they even had a council meeting from the early church that was being led by Jesus' brother, James. <laughs> and uh, we like to ask the question, what would it take for you to believe that your brother was the Christ? <laughs> That's what I, yeah, like, that ain't happening. I know my brother, there ain't no way. And James grew up believing that he was not the Christ. He was a loco. He was a crazy man. He didn't know what he was talking about. I don't know why he has his high ideas about himself. But suddenly James is leading the church. What happened? The resurrection of Jesus happened. If your brother comes back from the dead, you might want to think twice about it. All right? So James is now gone from being an unbeliever to being a believer that his brother, Jesus, is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. And he gathers all the disciples together in Jerusalem because the question is happening because the church was started by Jews and everybody was happy when it was just the Jews. But then suddenly it was like the invitation is going out and all these Gentiles are coming in. And the question is, do we have to have, do they have to be circumcised? Um, you know, how many of you would sign up for circumcision? You know, it's like, eh, you know, don't like to think about that. 
And, and so, do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to follow the dietary laws? What, what about, you know, the, the Ten Commandments? What about all the 400 laws that we can't follow? And, and, and so, they're asking these kind of questions. And finally, the answer came out from the disciples themselves that said, no. Why would we saddle them with some laws that we couldn't even live up to? There's only one way to be saved. It's through faith and trust in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, I want you to hear two competing thoughts that I think Christians still wrestle with today. Um, Sometimes, even though we think we're saved, we realize we're really not good. We're not really holy. We're not really righteous. And if that's you this morning, if you're thinking, I'm just, I'm just not worthy. I'm not good enough. I know in myself. I want you to think about the best person you know, the one that you want to be like when you grow up. And it's like, you know, I want to be like that when I grow up. But I want you to realize that righteousness is way above them. If you're aiming at somebody you know and wanting to be like them, you're aiming way too low. Um, I said, that to say this. Um, If you're thinking you're not good enough, you're right. Um, The bad news is you're actually way worse than you thought. Snap. (laughs) What? (laughs) In fact, there's a whole group of people not coming to church today because I don't need to hear how bad I am. I already know how bad I am. I don't need to go to church and have some preacher tell me how bad I am. But, but I want you to understand, because we talked about it in the last few weeks, remember what we started, the first sermon and everything we should start with and understand and is founded on is God's love. God loves. And that's the second thing that you're wrestling with is that you need to understand that God loves you way more than you will ever know or understand. And so we have these competing thoughts that are going, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. And the pastor says, you're right, you're not good enough. It's way worse than you think. Now, we alluded to, and if you read the scriptures um, at the end of chapter one and you got into chapter two, there were some specific sins. I do believe that the Old Testament is still good. In fact, I want you to hear this. The Old Testament was the only Bible they had in Jesus's day. So when Paul is writing that all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and righteousness, he's talking about the Old Testament. So we can't just jettison it. I think it's important to understand it's our foundation because here's what God was doing. He looked down at people and said, God is good. People are bad. God is good. People are bad. But we want people to be good and we want to be in a right relationship with them. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to single out one group of people, the Israelites. And we're going to show them the right way. And here's what I want. My design for the Israelites is to be the people of God. Not to lord it over anybody else. And sometimes the Jews admit now that they've missed it. But they were supposed to live in such a way in a right relationship with God that everybody else would throw down their idol worship, their pagan worship, their polytheistic worship and say, I now see there is one God. It is the true God. It's the God of Israel. They were supposed to be a light. But what happened is they got focused on themselves and their own political ambitions. And, and, um, and it's not that they didn't live up to it, but we're still living into it. But that was the old way. And now the new way has come, and it's through Jesus Christ. But when we talked about those specific sins, there, it's not an all-inclusive. There's a lot more sins that aren't listed in there. But if you read into chapter 2, and that's why I didn't highlight any of the sins, Because what we made it sure is understand the first week was about God's love. The second week was about God's wrath. There is wrath. And and, and there are people who are separated from God eternally. And who is that group called? (laughs) They're called sinners. Today we're going to learn we're all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. But in chapter 2, Paul writes, but you can't point out anybody else's sin can't we just say that's one of the greatest temptations? Isn't it easier to see somebody else's sin 
Nobody thinks of themselves as really being greedy people, but you see an adulterer over there? Oh, (laughs) we are all over that, right? We can get on it. But the tendency is we all belong to the group. Sometimes we in the church don't get this right because sometimes we like to think of ourselves as the frozen chosen. And we just want to be in church as much as possible and we don't want to interact with the outside world because they might get their cooties on us and they might get us in an unholy or unrighteous way. And so we just want to hang out in the church until Scotty beams us up. Come on, Lord, just, you know, don't touch me. I don't want to become unholy. I don't want to become unrighteous. I just want to just go to heaven. I want to just be with God right now. So look at it. No, that's not the way it works. What we're supposed to be is the people of grace and the people of love, the people who understand that we are sinners and there's good news. We're not supposed to be pointing out at everybody else's sin. Paul says nobody has the right to do that. There's only one who is just, and that is God. So let's take a look at our passage this morning. It comes from Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 21 through 26. But now, he writes, a righteousness from God. All right? Everybody wants to be right needs to pay attention to this. If you want to be right with God, if you want to be holy, if you want to be saved, you have to listen to this. But now a righteousness from God. What's he say? Apart from the law. That means separate from the law. The law can't save you. So there's a righteousness from God, a salvation from God that is apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So he's saying the Old Testament is useful. The law and the prophets are useful in showing and leading and guiding us and teaching us and rebuking us and showing us the way. But the only way any of us can be ever saved and be right with God is through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Verse 22. This righteousness from God comes through faith. Everybody say faith. Faith in Jesus Christ to all. Everybody say all. (laughs) That means all y'all, but it means all them. The same grace is available to everyone. That's why we're to be the bearers of good news. Um, There is no difference. No difference in us. No difference in them. Verse 23, some of you know this one well because preachers like to hammer on this one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, but we forget to talk about verse 24, and are justified, made right, freely by his grace. It's a gift of God. It's nothing that we have earned. It's nothing that we have done. It's just because he loves us that he has provided a way to be with him, to be right, and as we are to be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That means that he paid the price for us. He went in our stead and paid the price so that we could be freely offered his grace. Verse 25, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, He had left sins committed beforehand unpunished, and he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so let's take a look at our passage again, and what is he talking about? Well, if you want to know what he's talking about, it's right there in verse 21. Hear what he says. He says, but now. In order for there to be a but now, there had to be a back then, all right? So back then, the old way was the law, and he says, but now there is a righteousness from God that's apart from the law. You can't get saved by doing right things. There's only one way, a righteousness from God apart from the law, which has been made known and to which the law and the prophets testify. And it's through our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. So what's the problem? The problem, and, and, and it has to do with all of us, is that we have all sinned. I, I think this is one of the big confusions of the church. I believe there's been this mishmash of stuff that's been going on because even we in the church haven't let go from the Jerusalem council. We haven't let go of the law. 
And so we still think that we're righteous because we do the right things and we're teaching others to do the same and then we're feeling bad about ourselves when we can't live up to it and all that kind of stuff. That is old way of thinking. But I think, I, I, I really do believe this, that we still have seats available in here. United States used to be a Christian country. It was founded on Christian values. Today, Still, somewhere around 75% of Christians, or of Americans, claim to be Christians. <laughs> of those, listen, of those, only about 10% will actually be in church. Why? Because I think some are existing on cheap grace, and then some are still thinking that the church is an error because their own hypocrisy. <laughs> They've come They've tried church. They didn't like the pastor. They didn't like the people. They didn't like being told they were wrong when they saw people doing some of the very same things. I'm going to talk about this in just a little bit, how I think we can right that ship and, and turn that around. So uh, what is righteousness? Right is being right with God. What is the problem? We have all sinned. Um, now, if you are one who wants to hold on to the Old Testament, let me make this clear to you. Um, let's just take just the Ten Commandments, not the other hundreds that they added on to it. But the Ten Commandments, which came from God, and I've heard this argument, it was written in stone. It must be important. And God, it's the only thing he wrote. So we better hold on to that one as the Ten Commandments. Um, and sometimes we can look at the Ten Commandments and feel pretty good about ourselves. I mean, we know one of the commandments is thou shalt not murder. Anybody murder anybody lately? <laughs> okay, good. Nobody... Nobody in the choir even? You guys hey, raise your hand for everything. Some of you probably were like, oh, you know. But yeah, no. So what do we do? We go, check. Haven't done that one lately. I'm still okay. And then we, you know, go on to some of the others. But then, and in fact, I've heard Andy Stanley argue this. He, he said that we still argue for the Ten Commandments to be on our courthouses. And, and the reason they're still there, because many of them are written in stone and it's going to cost too much to change it. It's not that people actually believe it anymore. It's just that they can't remove it because it's just going to cost a lot of money. And it's a lot of problems, not worth the hassle. But he says, why isn't anybody arguing for the Sermon on the Mount to be up there? Because if the Ten Commandments are here in righteousness, Jesus makes it harder. H have you ever read them? Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, you know, the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount. Because he says things like, okay, you have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But I'm telling you, and we've all agreed that nobody here has killed anybody lately, all right? Uh, the, uh, and then it, he says, but if you have been angry. <laughs> oh, man, how many of you have been angry lately? <laughs> angry with a wife, a husband, a brother, a sister. Some of you haven't talked to family members for years. He says, even if you've been angry, you're guilty. Um, Adultery. I heard this one from Tim Keller. He said, there's a lot of sin that people don't really think about for themselves. He said, like greed. Um, people don't really think of themselves as greedy because there's always somebody greedier. So they don't never think of it. But then there's some sins that are obviously clear. He says, like adultery. He said, nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, oh, wait a minute. You're not my wife. People committing adultery are very clear. They're committing adultery. They're sleeping with somebody that's not their wife. Now, please don't raise your hand for this one, okay? But I know in a room this size, somebody here has done it. Somebody has committed adultery. But there's probably half of you that go, check, I have not committed adultery. But then he goes on to say, but if you've even thought about it. Oh, man. You see what I'm saying? He took the law and he made it even higher. Then the question is, who then can be saved? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we stop short. Uh, you can find this in Matthew chapter 6. Right at the bottom there, it says, For if you do not forgive, then neither will your sins be forgiven. We don't like to talk about that one because every one of us has been hurt by somebody and we're harboring unforgiveness. And yet what does Jesus say? He says, if you don't forgive, this is Jesus. This isn't Paul, it's not Matthew, it's not Mark. It's Jesus. You can argue with everybody else. You can't argue with Jesus. When Jesus says, neither will your sins be forgiven. And then some of you are like, okay, you've got me. I get it. I, I'm a sinner. 
Who then can be saved, all right? If if you're thinking that, then God bless you because I'm communicating. (laughs) You're getting it. You understand and you're right. But the question is, who can be saved? And Jesus says, for man, it is impossible. But for God, all things are possible and he's the one who made a way. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, Um, so what's the solution? The solution is Jesus. We have all sinned and fallen short of glory and we all need a way back and the law can't do it. The law is imperfect. We can't be good enough to make our way back. So Jesus came and he paid the price for us so that we could be washed clean, that we can, listen to this, we can have power over sin. Some of you have already gotten off your diet from just a couple of days ago. <laughs> it's just like, oh, who can do it? Who can be good enough, right? Um, but while we were yet sinners, I want you to hear this. While we were yet sinners, God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sinners. He didn't wait for us to get right. He didn't wait for us to follow the Ten Commandments or the other 400 laws or 600 laws. Or He just said, you know what? I'm going to send away through my son, through my grace. So how do we get it? One way, you have to ask for it, right? God makes it available. It's a free gift to everyone. But the condition is you have to get that you need it, that you even need saving, and then you just simply ask for it. It's a gift that he's already given to you. You just have to accept it and to receive it. What are we saved for? Um, I think we need to hear this. N.T. Wright says this. Don't stress the doctrine of your own salvation so much that you miss out on what you're being saved for. What are we saved from? We're saved from being sinners. When we give our life to Jesus Christ, then we can have the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit can come upon us and overpower, breaking the bondage of sin in our life. Remember, the goal is not heaven. The goal is to become Christ-like, to become more human. When somebody does something atrocious, we say they're inhuman. But when they're doing things the way that Jesus did it, we say, we like that. That is becoming all that we can be when we can be more like Jesus Christ. All right, listen to this. I'm going to read this because I think it's really cool. I think it's accurate. We, the church, and and I will not give credit to anybody else. This one's all me if you don't like it or agree with it, um, and I may be wrong, but here's what I think. We, the church, have confused, entwined, and enmeshed law and grace. At one time, the church was growing in America. We've been on a 50-year decline. I'm convinced it's because we don't really understand grace. Being called to a revival a writing of the ship. We, the church, the convinced, the saved, do not exist as the world's morality police. I'm convinced many of them out there aren't in here because they see our own hypocrisy and we're more interested in telling them on what they're doing wrong. How would it change things if we stopped trying to tell the world what they're doing wrong And we started telling them about the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. We exist as the people of grace to tell others about the good news of God's grace. Right, listen to this. This is is good stuff in case you're not sure. Right behavior follows right theology. You get that? It's not that we get right so that we can be right. We get God's grace And then we act right. Right behavior follows right theology. I'm convinced that churches will fill up once again when we stop focusing on people's sin and recognize ourselves as sinners saved by grace and become once again the ambassadors of God's love and grace. Amen? All right. So let me finish with two thoughts. Um, now, nah, I see the time. I'll finish with one thought. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope you've been tracking along where I'm going with law and grace, law and grace, and the juxtaposition between the two, how they work together. The law points to the need for grace. But I think Jesus embodies this because it comes from a real life. 
example. When the Pharisees were trying to get rid of Jesus, they couldn't get rid of Jesus because Jesus' followers were growing. They hadn't seen anybody else raise people from the dead. They hadn't seen anybody else fix hands and, and leprosy and heal the way that he heals. And so the people are confused and they're starting to follow after him. And so many people are followers of this, this Christ, this Jesus, the way they're believing that he is. But the Pharisees are sure that he's not. They're sure that he's not doing things right. He's talking against the law and, and, he's, and he's offering grace to people and they just want to get rid of him. So they're constantly trying to trap him. And, and here's what they did. They found, they found a woman uh, in the act of committing adultery. And I want you to imagine what it was like. And they would go into this house. Uh, we don't know what happened to the man. Was the man not committing adultery? I, you know, I'm thinking he was too, but they, but they drug out the woman. And, and I want you to think about the humiliation as they drug her out into the town square, threw her at the feet of Jesus. Now, she wasn't confused. She knew exactly what she was doing, and she knew exactly what the law said. And, and, and the Pharisees threw her down at Jesus' feet and said, now, here is a woman caught in adultery. What do you say? And Jesus basically says, hey, what do you read? You, you know what the law says. And in case you're not sure, the Mosaic law says that anybody caught in adultery should be stoned to death. The idea, rid the evil from among you. When you have sinners and you know that they're sinners and they're caught in sin, then go ahead and kill them. Stone them to death. But much to their chagrin, Jesus bent down and he began drawing, writing in the sand. And they're, they're like, do something, Jesus. What do you say? What are you going to do? Because they want to get on with getting rid of him. But we don't know what Jesus was writing in the sand, but some people have alluded that maybe they were like, hey, Bill, I saw you last night. <laughs> I knew you weren't with your wife. <laughs> hey, Fred, I saw you hold that money back from your tithe yesterday. And one by one, he started going through all the accusers who had the stones ready. I want you to hear that. They were ready because they knew what the law was, and they were holy, and they were righteous, and they were going to do what the law said, and they were going to put her to death, and they are going to get rid of the evil. And Jesus simply said, I believe without looking up, he just said, you who is without sin, cast the first stone. They were convicted. Even the Pharisees felt convicted. <laughs> One by one, they dropped their stones and they walked away. Now, I want you to get this picture because I believe Jesus knelt down. I believe the woman was in tears, expecting to be stoned, killed. Can you imagine to be caught in your own sin and the person staring you in the eye is Jesus? I can't believe she was even looking up. I think she was ashamed of herself. And she was looking down, tears streaming. And I believe he grasped her hand. And I believe he said, where are your accusers? And she kind of looked up and looked around. She said, they've all gone. Hear this. She was wrong. She had sinned. <laughs> Who's the only one who hadn't sinned? Jesus. Who was the only one who could have fulfilled the law? Jesus. Who was the one who would have been right and holy and just if he had murdered her, sent her to her death, stoned her to death for the penalty of her sin? He didn't do it. He superseded the law <laughs> with his own law, the law of grace. I think some of you came here this morning, some of you may be thinking you're better than you are. And certainly God's going to love you because you're not like those wicked, mean, and nasty people out there. Some of you came here today and you were hoping to hear a good word. You wanted to know that God did love you and that, that he cares about you. And you need to hear about the grace of Jesus Christ. I want you to take this picture and I want you to think about as God reveals your own sin and the only one who is standing there staring at you face to face is Jesus. But what he does is he doesn't excuse the sin. He says, go and sin no more. Go, leave your life of sin. 
So when you hear me say the law is the old way, I'm not saying we do away with it. I think we live into it. I think it shows us the way. But what it really shows us is every one of us needs the grace of Jesus Christ. And my prayer is for each and every one of us that we would realize that we are sinners in need of grace. But I want you to hear God loves you so much that he's provided a way that we can be washed clean, that we could be forgiven, the power of sin broken in our life, that we can become more and more like Jesus Christ and live and reign with him forever and ever. And in the meantime, until Scotty, Jesus, Peter, whoever beams us up, then what we are called to do is to carry on that light and be the people of grace who goes out and tells the world not of their sin, but of God's love and grace for them. Amen.